dirigera vers le, vers le Marriott de Château Champlain à Montréal, où les Alouettes vont confirmer, Mathieu, la nomination de Dan Hawkins. On oui. en avait parlé la semaine dernière, donc comme nouvel entraîneur-chef de l'équipe. Hawkins qui va succéder à Mark Trussman et qui devient le 20e entraîneur-chef de l'histoire des Alouettes. D'entrée de jeu, ce que l'on sait de Dan Hawkins, c'est que dans sa personnalité, ce sera à l'antipode, à l'opposé de ce qu'était Mark Trussman. Et on, on, évidemment, on ne sait pas encore exactement comment il est comme personne, mais de ce qu'on lit, de ce qu'on a vu, de ce qu'on entend. Euh, et on se souvient, quand on compare à Tressman, c'est sûr qu'on a l'impression qu'ils sont tous antipodes. Hein? Tressman, c'est un, un coach avec un style plutôt monotone, mm. euh, très calme, toujours rationnel, toujours, rationnel, toujours euh, bien euh, composé, toujours tranquille. Euh, et, et Dan Hawkins, de son côté, lui, ben, a l'air peut-être un peu plus flamboyant, peut-être un peu plus... Euh, euh, peut-être plus, euh, on dit loud en anglais, peut-être plus bruyant un peu, le fait des vagues un peu plus, fait des commentaires chocs, n'hésite pas justement à se laisser emporter, beaucoup plus émotif que ce qu'on voyait du côté de Tressman. Mm. Alors je vois définitivement une différence à ce niveau-là au début, et ça, ça pourrait avoir un impact justement sur comment le vestiaire est géré, comment il se comporte au quotidien. On peut peut-être avoir plus de déclarations chocs, pour ceux qui aiment les déclarations chocs, Dan Hawkins a l'air d'être un de ceux allez qui sur vont YouTube, nous là, et ouais, ça fait Dan Hawkins, vous allez avoir quelques segments très, très croustillants, mais euh, pour revenir à Hawkins, lui, il n'a jamais dirigé au niveau non. professionnel. Non, il ne connaît pas la Ligue canadienne, un peu comme Mike Trussman, mais Trussman avait un bagage beaucoup plus grand. Est-ce que ça t'inquiète de savoir qu'un gars comme Dan Hawkins n'a pas d'expérience au niveau professionnel? Et ça ne m'inquiète pas dans un sens où moi, quand Trussman est arrivé, j'étais probablement une de ses plus fortes... Je ne veux pas dire que j'étais une de ses plus fortes critiques, mais j'ai quand même critiqué ce, ce, cette décision-là parce que je me disais, bon... Bon, un Américain qui vient ici imposer son style, qui va nous parler de ses années de la NFL, qui va tenter de faire exactement comme là-bas, puis qui ne s'adaptera pas à notre football. On avait vu plusieurs coachs faire ce genre de transition-là, ça n'avait pas fonctionné. Notamment, on avait vu ça avec Toronto, mm -hmm. on avait vu ça avec Winnipeg, ça n'avait pas fonctionné. Donc, évidemment, que les précédents n'étaient pas nécessairement positifs. Bon, là, Trussman est arrivé à changer un peu la donne, a changé un peu la réputation des entraîneurs qui ne connaissaient, connaissaient pas la Ligue canadienne. Alors, lui va devoir s'ajuster à la Ligue canadienne, premièrement. Et deuxièmement, comme tu le dis, au niveau professionnel, la dynamique entre les joueurs universitaires et celles professionnelles est complètement différente. Mm. Premièrement, leur âge. Hein, et au niveau universitaire américain, là, on parle de 17 à 21, 22 ans. Donc, c'est des jeunes adultes, des, des fins adolescents. Et là, il est avec des adultes. Donc là, c'est vraiment des adultes. Tu as des gars comme Cavio qui a essentiellement 40 ans. Tu as du monde beaucoup plus vieux qui sont là. Donc la dynamique est tout à fait différente. Ils sont payés pour faire ça. C'est leur job. Alors vraiment, ça, je pense que ça va être le plus gros ajustement qu'ils doivent devoir faire. Parce que le, le coaching demeure le coaching. Mais de le faire avec des adultes et le faire avec des ados, c'est complètement différent. Et les chiffres parlent beaucoup. On va aller voir un peu euh, ce qu'a l'air la carrière de Dan Hawkins. Parce qu'il a dirigé, comme tu l'as dit, principalement au niveau universitaire. Oui. Et on vous a préparé un tableau à ce sujet-là. Euh, principalement, là, ces trois dernières expériences au niveau universitaire avec Willamette de 93 à 97, 40 victoires, 11 défaites, Boys State de 2001 à 2005 comme entraîneur-chef, 53 victoires, 11 défaites, il a participé à 4 bowls, en a gagné 2, mais là sa dernière expérience comme entraîneur-chef au Colorado de 2006 à 2010, 19 victoires, 39 défaites, sa dernière expérience comme entraîneur-chef, n'a pas été très concluante. Qu'est-ce que non. ça dit? Et depuis les deux dernières années, il est euh, trois dernières années, analyste à ESPN aussi. Et c'est donc très intéressant comme saut, parce qu'on a parlé de Tressman. Bon, mais Tressman, lui, arrivait des, 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 euh, du niveau euh, aux États-Unis. Lui, il passe de niveau analyste. Donc, c'était un analyste à la télé au niveau universitaire, et là, ça vient au professionnel comme entraîneur-chef. Le saut est complètement différent. Quand on regarde justement ce qu'il a fait à Boise State, il était avec une bonne équipe, une équipe qui était en mm. émergence. Dirk Carter, qui était le coordonnateur offensif du côté des Falcons cette année, était l'entraîneur-chef, il était son adjoint. Ils ont commencé vraiment à relancer ce programme-là, qui était un programme qui s'en allait nulle part, finalement, qui était pratiquement un programme inconnu. Ils ont mis ce programme-là sur la map. Il a repris ce programme-là en, en 2001, alors que c'est un programme qui allait quand même bien. Il a continué cette progression-là. Et aujourd'hui, Boise State est encore un programme qui connaît beaucoup de succès. Bon, après ça, il a décidé de partir pour un programme plus prestigieux, Colorado, beaucoup d'argent. Un programme qui, eux aussi, voulaient relancer, justement, euh, l'équipe de football. Ça n'a vraiment pas été glorieux. Désastre. Ça a été désastre. Dès qu'ils sont arrivés là-bas, ça a été difficile. En 2009, il avait prédit une saison de 10 victoires. Ils ont eu seulement 3 victoires. Donc là, il a commencé à avoir beaucoup, beaucoup de critiques. Et en 2010, on se souviendra, c'est pourquoi il a été congédié, ou en tout cas, du moins, une des raisons, évidemment, tous les insuccès qu'il avait connus aux années par avant. Dans un match, où il venait par 28 ça, points. Ça, c'est important. Il faut bien écouter ouais. ça, parce qu'il a marqué, à sa façon, l'histoire de cette école. Exactement. Il menait par 28 points au quatrième quart contre l'Université Kansas, une équipe rivale de division. Et euh, au quatrième quart, son fils, Cody Hawkins, qui était le carrière partant. Donc déjà là, s'il a décidé que c'est son fils qui était le quart, j'ai pas de problème avec ça. 
Mais euh, des gens disent que c'est pas nécessairement le meilleur corps disponible. Mais il avait la chance de briser le record, un record de verge par la passe de l'université. Alors qu'est-ce qu'il a fait? Il a décidé de continuer à passer le ballon. Au lieu de contrôler le temps de possession, courir avec comme tous les entraîneurs frais, essayer de courir avec le ballon. Ils ont donc perdu. Ils ont laissé filer cette avancée de 28 points. La plus grande, finalement, déconfiture en 121 ans du exact. programme de Colorado. Après le match, il avait donné seulement 27 secondes d'entrevue alors qu'il était obligé de donner un certain temps. L'université n'avait pas apprécié. On l'a congédié. On a arraché son contrat pour 2 millions. Et c'est depuis ce moment-là qu'il n'est pas entraîneur. On entend beaucoup cette histoire-là. Je pense qu'il ne faut pas trop en mettre. Il faut comprendre ce qui s'est passé. Il faut voir un peu le titre du, de, de, de coach que c'est. Mais écoute, si c'est une équipe qui passe le ballon, comme c'était une équipe qui passait le ballon, on va continuer à faire ça. On va continuer à passer. Mais il faut s'ajuster. Et c'est ça, moi, que j'ai hâte de voir. Est-ce que ça va être un carrière qui va s'ajuster ou ça va être un carrière qui va y aller avec ses émotions? Un coach doit absolument être rationnel. On parlait de coach mmh. Westman qui était comme ça tantôt. C'est exactement comme ça pour moi qu'un coach doit être. Il doit prendre des décisions à froid, doit être rationnel, ne doit pas laisser les émotions rentrer en ligne de compte. Et ce qui semble être le cas avec Dan Hawkins, donc j'aime bien de voir comment il va s'ajuster. Euh, explique aussi aux gens, Mathieu, que Dan Hawkins n'est pas étranger aux alouettes. C'est qu'il a ouais. déjà connu un peu les Jim Pop, même avec Mark Tressman. Il ouais. a eu la chance de travailler avec ces deux gars-là. Oui, et, et on parle beaucoup de Tressman parce que c'est lui qui a quitté, mais c'était un peu la même histoire que Tressman. Tressman, en 2007, avait été un entraîneur invité au camp d'entraînement des alouettes. Il faut comprendre qu'il y en a à chaque année des entraîneurs invités. Il y a des entraîneurs au niveau universitaire professionnel mm. qui viennent et qui, justement, assistent au camp, rencontrent les joueurs. Et ça a été la même chose. Dan Hawkins, lui, a eu la chance de rencontrer les joueurs lors d'un entraînement euh, hivernal en Caroline du Nord. Donc, a déjà eu un premier contact avec l'organisation et euh, j'imagine que ça a dû aider beaucoup, justement, à son embauche là, au sein des Alouettes. On va se rendre bientôt au Marriott, Château-Champlain. Rapidement, on va présenter. Il y a beaucoup de monde. On oui, attend beaucoup, beaucoup de monde. Là. Ouais. Vous allez voir, là, y a, on le voit derrière, là. Il y a comme une quinzaine de personnes. C'est grandiose comme présentation. On est loin d'une petite chaise avec deux personnes. Mais les, les adjoints vont être présentés. Un gars comme Mike Miller, qui va travailler comme coordonnateur offensif avec Anthony Calvio. Il y a un beau défi aussi devant lui. Là. Oui, et, et je pense que c'est très important et c'est très indicatif de justement la vision qu'on avait avec Dan Hawkins. Tout le monde est là. Le gros défi de trouver un entraîneur-chef, c'était de lui permettre d'avoir une équipe d'entraîneurs et qui serait en mesure de mettre une équipe d'entraîneurs ensemble potentielle. Et c'est ce qu'il a fait présentement. Il a mis une équipe complète. Bon, on va se rendre directement, mon cher Mathieu, à trouver Jacques Moreau pour cette conférence de presse. Je voudrais également saluer les personnes qui sont à l'écoute. Le déroulement sera fort simple. Vous entendrez d'abord les interventions de Maître Paul Harris et de Mark Waitman. Ils seront suivis par Jim Pop qui nous présentera notre nouvel entraîneur-chef. Une période de questions suivra après l'allocution de l'entraîneur. After speeches, we will have a question period. Sans plus tarder, j'aimerais céder la parole au président du conseil d'administration des Alouettes, Maître Paul Harris. Merci, Jacques. Bonjour à tous. Je voudrais commencer par remercier Jim Pop pour tous ses efforts pendant ce processus. Before I turn the proceedings over to Mark Waitman and Jim, I'd like to take this opportunity on behalf of Bob Wettenhall and the entire club to publicly thank Jim for his tireless efforts, invaluable guidance, and professionalism during this process. The Alouettes are fortunate to have Jim as our general manager. He is one of the very best in the business and a guiding force of the Alouettes' outstanding success on the field. Lastly, I'd like to make mention of the fact that although Bob Wettenhall Uh, has been intimately involved in the uh, process of selection of all these coaches. Um, due to a prior business commitment, he's unable to be here today. Uh, thanks. Merci, Monsieur Harris. Je voudrais maintenant donner la parole au chef des opérations des Alouettes, Monsieur Mark Waitman. Bonjour à tous. Uh, C'est une journée très excitante pour moi et pour l'organisation aujourd'hui. C'est le genre de moment où est-ce qu'on sent vraiment qu'on prend, qu prend un, un grand pas vers l'avant. Euh, avant de commencer, j'aimerais euh, euh, mentionner, récemment, certains observateurs euh, nous ont euh, reproché d'être absents, d'être moins présents. Je tiens à mentionner que je reconnais que on a peut-être la perception et peut-être qu qu ce, ce qu'on a laissé paraître, mais euh, vous voyez, le football, c'est notre passion, c'est notre quotidien, c'est notre raison d'être, et parfois on oublie de mentionner les autres éléments qui sont aussi très importants à l'organisation. Croyez-moi, il y a autant d'effervescence du côté administration qu'il y en a du côté football. Et nous sommes à revoir quelques façons de faire pour mieux communiquer les choses qu'on fait, autant dans la communauté et que sur le côté business. 
Dans quelques instants, Jim va vous présenter notre nouvel entraîneur-chef. Ça lui a pris environ un mois pour trouver un candidat de grand talent, former une, une équipe d'entraîneurs adjoints des plus excellents, et il a continué à améliorer notre équipe en ajoutant des joueurs de grand talent, que ce soit par euh, le marché des agents libres ou par le biais d'échanges. Mais du côté administratif, nous n'avons pas chômé pour autant. Dans les dernières semaines, dans les derniers mois, nous avons restructuré notre département des ventes et de marketing. Nous avons engagé un nouveau vice-président partenariat coopératif, Jean Couvrette, qui est ici aujourd'hui. Notre campagne de re renouvellement à TIF pour les billets de saison, qui s'est terminée avant les fêtes, a connu un succès sans précédent. Et nous venons, venons d'entreprendre la deuxième phase et la réponse est aussi excellente. Nous avons amorcé de la planification de nouveaux projets en collaboration avec le programme d'excellence de Football Québec afin de contribuer à la croissance du, du football amateur partout à travers la province. Également, la semaine dernière, nous avons lancé, à l'occasion de la semaine de la relâche scolaire, de, de, excuse, la, la semaine de la persévérance scolaire, excusez-moi, la 16e édition de notre programme Ensemble à l'école avec le CN et les Alouettes. C'est un programme dont on est très fier. Nos joueurs qui y participent sont excellents. Et cette année, comme on en a fait l'habitude, on visitera plus de 120 écoles dans la province et nos joueurs parleront avec plus de 60 jeunes élèves québécois. De plus, notre initiative d'offrir des cours de français aux joueurs qui participent au programme a soulevé beaucoup d'intérêt. Nous sommes très fiers de nos joueurs qui y participent et c'est une façon de plus pour nous d'améliorer notre présence dans la communauté et auprès de nos partisans. Notre base de partisans aussi continue à grandir. Par exemple, on compte plus de 105 000 personnes sur notre, pa notre page Facebook. Nos partisans sont enthousiastes, ils sont passionnés sont exigeants. Et c'est notre devoir de ne pas les décevoir. Le camp d'entraînement débutera dans à peine 15 semaines. Et j'ai très hâte. D'abord, comme chef des opérations, je sens que nous allons réussir de grandes choses comme organisation en 2013. Mais aussi comme partisan. Avec un entraîneur de premier plan, des joueurs de grand talent et un leader comme Anthony Cabillo, je suis convaincu qu'on va avoir beaucoup de plaisir au stade Percival Monson cet été. Just to wrap up, um, I've had the, the, the pleasure uh, and privilege of knowing and working with Jim for about 18 years now, since Baltimore in 1995. And uh, you would think that by now, I would become accustomed to the level of talent that he manages to find, uh, both in the, in the form of coaches and players, year in and year out. Um, uh, but once again, I think uh, the element of surprise this year uh, is there um, uh, once again, and we're very happy for that. And uh, I, I must say that uh, throughout the many discussions we've had uh, over, especially in the last few weeks, um, a, uh, a more passionate and devoted person to the Alouette's cause you simply will not find. And uh, I'm personally very, very uh, grateful and happy to uh, be in the same team. So, um, euh, without further ado, ben, je laisse maintenant la parole à Jim pour vous faire l'annonce de la ou les bonnes nouvelles de la journée. Merci. Bonjour, good afternoon. Um, Paul, Mark, thank you. Merci beaucoup. I just want to especially thank our organization and, um, and Bob Wettenhall uh, for the tireless effort that we've made. Uh, Yeah, for 17 years, but also just in this effort to pull together uh, every chance we could to get as many people in front of us. And, uh, and Bob's just instrumental to making sure things are done the proper way and the right way. And um, if you don't know it, you just don't realize what a tremendous person he is, but a tremendous owner he is to have a team and a city to be proud of. Uh, I want to thank the fans and the media for being patient through this whole process. Um, it seems like it's taken a long time. Uh, believe me, from my end, it's it's flown by. It's it's been tireless and and uh, nonstop from uh, morning to night to morning. 
and um, it just it keeps going and it's it's crazy. I want to thank our players. They're probably the most anxious to know what's going on and who their next uh, leader and chief is to lead them in the locker room on the field and uh, uh, to win championships with. So uh, it's happening. Uh, all the candidates that we interviewed uh, spoke to. Um, I'll get into detail that in a second. Uh, they, they were fantastic, uh, very patient through the process. And, uh, and, uh, and Mark Tressman and his staff for the last five years, because they did a tremendous job in helping us continue our tradition of winning and winning championships and, and, and playing for championships. So um, merci beaucoup to all those people and, uh, and to all of you for uh, being here today, and thank you for... Uh, taking an interest in this. This has been going on for, seems like it's four weeks. <coughs> seems like uh, it's probably really, it's been crazy six weeks really for myself uh, with my, my situation uh, being interviewed in different places also along with Coach Tressman and then him getting a job and all those uh, media interviews uh, into having to find a new coach. And, uh, and not only that, um, I'm losing also, one of my right-hand people in this, or this tremendous person in this organization, Marcel Desjardins. So a lot, lots of phone calls, lots of talks, lots of things going on, and, uh, and I think we've managed it unbelievable to, to be where we are today and moving forward. Um, you know, Bob and I set out and had a real hard discussion about this of what the next candidate was going to be, and, and we addressed a lot of issues with that coach or coaching candidates. Uh, one thing that we did come to a conclusion, we wanted to give somebody a chance that had not been a head coach in the CFL before. So those questions come out, why didn't you interview this person, why didn't you interview that person? Uh, that's one reason. Uh, we wanted to give somebody uh, that had not had that chance in this league to give them that chance. So uh, part of that process was to look at people um, uh, that uh, Either where, whether they were local, and there was one exception to this this crew, and that and that was uh, Danny Machocha, who had been a head coach, but who was also here in town and from here, and uh, and we felt it was important that uh, he had the opportunity uh, to interview for the job. Um, but out of the six candidates that we asked to speak to in the CFL, um, we were given permission to talk to five. Uh, none of them had been a head coach in the league before and out of that five uh, only one actually interviewed for the job came I'm talking came to see uh, Bob and I in Florida for the interview uh, the other uh, four pulled themselves out of it and uh, for whatever their all their reasons were and that's not to discuss but uh, moving forward there was one guy that and that was Mark Washington and he did a fa fabulous job in the interview uh, we spoke to over 50 candidates um, and that were interviewed via phone, in person, in multiple states, and then eventually uh, brought to Florida and Palm Beach to interview in person in front of the owner. Um, we spoke to way over uh, w much more people. I mean, another 50 to 100 people that were calling, uh, pushing uh, their candidate, wanting to see their friend get to be the next uh, head coach or, or their colleague or their working partner and, and to express their interest uh, in the, who would be our next head coach and just want to tell us. So it was relentless and tireless uh, speaking to all these people to make sure that we chose the right person. And, uh, and it's very important that uh, we did a thorough job and I do believe we did that. Um, this is a prestigious job. And this job's not for everyone. Uh, I know that. Uh, it's a tough place. We expect to win. And when I say it's a tough place, it's a tough place but it, within our organization. We, we say we're going to win, and we believe that. And we want to bring that to the public, and we want to bring that to our city and, and because we're champions. And that's what we want for Montreal. And so it starts internally first. And we know this job's not for everybody. And we really laid out criteria when we set this out that you were going to have to be able to do X, Y, and Z. And if you couldn't do it, you're not getting the job, no matter how strong a candidate that you are. Um, we, have, we have in 17 years been in 17 straight playoffs, 15 division championships, 10 Grey Cups uh, in, in that short period of time. 
and uh, or eight Grey Cups, excuse me. And and in that, uh, not everyone can handle that pressure. Okay, not everyone can handle that pressure. It, it is it is a high level of pressure to follow anybody that's successful. And everybody that's been the coach in this team has been successful. So uh, the players that we have, they expect success, and and we expect success. And the next coach that comes in, there's coaches who do not are, are, are scared of the job simply because they are scared of failing or they can't win. And, and that goes on in any city, but especially with this ball club. Uh, we are the Montreal Alouettes, and we have pride in that. For over a decade, if not for the last 17 years, um, I think I can say this truthfully, and and uh, and if I miss out, I apologize to somebody if I do. But I would say we're the most successful pro franchise in Quebec, in the CFL, and in all of Canada. And it takes special people to want to be a part of that and who can handle that and who can maintain that. Um, so we've taken this very seriously when we've gone through this process to pick the right person. Uh, the coaching search went in many directions. Uh, as I mentioned before, the amount of different candidates that we, we, and we had, we had candidates lined up to interview, and then they would pull themselves out, and then we would gain five more that would come in within two or three day period. So, and, and really, the process took a while, and that was fine. It was fine from Bob and I's end. If candidates decided they wanted to take a job elsewhere, then they couldn't wait. Very understood because it wasn't guaranteed they were going to get our job. So it was very diligent and, and continued through the process. Um, as we said from the start, this wasn't only about a great head coaching candidate. It was also because a lot of the guys were could have been the head coach. Uh, but it was also about that head coach being able to put a very strong coaching staff together. And part of that coaching staff was a criteria that we laid out as an organization. Now that all being said, there's one person that came to the forefront time and time as we discussed candidates over and over. Uh, this person cares about the game. He's passionate about it. He's passionate about his job. He's passionate about the players. He has tremendous leadership skills and he has tremendous teaching skills. This person has been successful and he will continue to be successful. So I'd like to introduce our 20th head coach of the Montreal Alouettes, Dan Hawkins. There you go, bud. Merci beaucoup. Bonjour, c'est sweet, très content date à Montréal. C'est un honneur de travailler pour cette ville et les LOS. I do not know French, but I will learn it. <laughs> so that's my first attempt. Um, my daughter's fluent in it. She should be here. She could translate. Very, very honored to be here. Uh, very humbled to be here. And I want to thank Mr. Wettenhall uh, through this process. I was very impressed with him and his vision for the organization. I think vision is, is critical and it has to come from the top and his desire to institutionalize this program in the city of Montreal and his commitment to Montreal is immense. His commitment to the community and what a quality program can do for the community is impressive his love and his commitment for the players and taking care of the players and what the what a role of a coach really is in any arena is impressive and his commitment to winning is impressive there's no question that Jim Pop is uh, might be the the greatest GM in the history of the CFL uh, he probably is the greatest GM in the history of the CFL and knows this league in and out knows personnel he's been a coach He's a great resource. So meeting and getting to know both of these guys on a more thorough level 
was was thrilling for me in and of itself. But the combined vision of Mr. Wettenhall and Jim Pop continued to draw me to this position. Uh, there's a lot of people I have to thank. I can tell you this, Mark Tressman, when I got involved with Mark last year and he let me come with his staff to Raleigh, it was almost like finding a brother from another mother. Uh, we are, were the, it was amazing how we said things similarly, thought thim similarly about the science of football. Uh, Mr. Wettenhall made the comment, he goes, there's only two people I've ever heard say that word, and that's you and Mark Tressman. And uh, so I owe a lot to him and his staff. He's been very, very beneficial in this whole process. It's been great. He texted me this morning. Um, so for the players on the club, I can tell you this, that I'm with you on the science of football. I'm with you the role of a coach and a mentor and uh, what all that means. I stand here because I've been fortunate to be with a lot of great organizations and a lot of great players. And that's where it starts, is your players. I've got one of my former players here at the dais today who's a former CFL player. Uh, but I have all those people to thank. You can't get here by yourself. This game will humble you. It has humbled me. Uh, it's not about always winning. Sometimes you fail. Sometimes life's hardest lessons are your failures. But I'm an out-of-the-box guy. The opportunity to coach in a French-speaking province in a foreign country with 12 guys and everybody in motion was right at my alley. For some people, they're a comfort zone guy. That's not me. That is not Dan Hawkins. You get nowhere by playing it safe. You get nowhere by taking no risks. You know, part of life is growing and climbing. You fall down, you skin your knee, you learn from it, you get back up and you go. Uh, I've had a tremendous career because of a lot of great players, a lot of great institutions, and a lot of great coaches, and I can't do it by myself. I am a passionate guy. I'm passionate about life. I'm passionate about football, the role of football, what it means in a society, what it means for the people in our organization. I also want to thank, I spent two years doing what some of you are doing out there in the media, uh, which, which some coaches would say the other guys. And those people at ESPN and Sirius Radio and all my people that I've worked for, that's been great. I spent two years really getting a PhD in football. It's interesting, and as many of the coaches up here would tell you, you're in this profession and you're grinding, 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 and you're trying to learn, you're trying to gain knowledge, and you go along for 30 years, and all of a sudden you're, you're able to step back. And there were a ton of college programs, pro programs, that allowed me to come in and research and learn and grow, and it's been fantastic. I've said I've got my Ph.D. in the last couple of years in football. It's been, uh, it's been an unbelievable growth uh, process. Uh, I also have to thank my, my wife and uh, Misty, who's here today, and she's really the head coach, uh, and you'll get to meet her. And, She's been the volunteer queen in every city that we've lived in, so if you have any organizations that need some help, she's your, she's your resource. Um, I promised Mr. Wettenhall when I met with him, uh, you know, coaches always have a, a lot of axioms that they go by, and I, I'm, it's great to see AC here, and I see we got a few players out here, but they know coaches have my... It really comes down to excellence with class, and I've said that for years, and I promised Mr. Wettenhall, I go, if I'm your head coach, I guarantee you, we will represent you, and that will be our mantra, that we will bring excellence in class to the organization, to the team, to the community, to your name, to your business, and I know how important um, um, that is. And I couldn't be more honored to be here. I'm looking forward to getting with the guys. I've watched a lot of tape on these these players. Our coaches are going to do their best to reach out to these guys immediately. Uh, part of this thing is, uh, on one hand, it's professional football, and on the other hand, every one of these guys is still just that same 12-year-old kid that wanted to put on pads and run out in the park and play football. And somewhere you bridge that that gap, and we promise to do that. Jim has been awesome with me in helping put this staff together. There's been a lot of phone calls, a lot of meetings, a lot of trips, 
this has gone on for a while but I really believe in a coach it's not just how much X's and O's you know can you teach it do you have the ask and demand can you get a guy to another level do you have that sort of teacher quality about you I think every coach good coach believes he's the servant of the player that there's other things out there that they're, they're a coach that a player can respect as a coach as a person that they can look to for guidance I believe in all that stuff and so the guys sitting up here are those kind of people they're people that you wouldn't mind having live next door to you work for your organization I'm all about that and that's the kind of people I've surrounded myself with and I'm, Jim has been great Mr. Wettenhall has been great in helping us put this staff together and I'm really excited. We've been working together here for a few days, uh, sequestered in a hotel, and I can tell you the synergy has been unbelievable. Unbelievable. To take people that have had boots on the ground for 20, 30 years, quality football coaches in a lot of different arenas, come together, it's a magic potion. Magic. We've got guys that have some CFL experience, NFL experience, college experience, coming from a lot of different points of life. Our goal is try to get us back to where Coach Trestman had these guys last year immediately. We're going to take that offensive playbook we already have. Guys, we're going to learn your language. French is hard enough as it is. We know a lot of different language. What AC calls gopher, I call streak. What he calls Madison, I call gator. It doesn't matter. We'll call it whatever he wants to call it. But we're going to work from those guys back and work to develop also the special teams and the defensive part of that equation. So we're going to lean on the players a lot to help us decipher the playbook, to get their input, to figure out what they like and what they don't like. I can tell you this right now, guys, it comes straight from the lips of Ben Cahoon. He said, if you can just tell them you'll honor the four and a half rule, man, will they be excited. And I will. And I will. So you're good. You're good on the four and a half hour rule. I've had the opportunity to be in on a number of jobs over the past couple of years. And to me, it's never been about a job. It's about a journey. And this thing just felt right in every sense of the word. Every sense of the word, I just had felt good about it. There was no trepidation whatsoever. Now, it took a long time, and I had to blow up Jim's phone a lot and have a lot of guys I know blow up his phone a lot. Um, and it took a while, so I appreciate their patience. But I'm very honored. You will find Dan Hawkins to be a very passionate person, a very honest person. I grew up in a town of about 200 people. My dad's a logger. I don't have a lot of political agendas. I'm not a hidden book. I'm using an open cover. Um, I get the role of the media. I was in it for two years. I hear you. I feel you. Um, but I'm passionate about this game. And I'm passionate about what it can do for a community, the societal impact. And, uh, and uh, hey, we all love to win. We all love to win. We all want to win. And uh, we all want to stand there and hold the, the Grey Cup at the end of the day. But for us, it's about working and grinding. I've been impressed with the work our staff's put in so far. And we're going to continue to stay here and grind uh, through the first. And we'll head back out on the second. We'll get back together another week in March. We'll get together early. Uh, before um, uh, mini camp, and then we'll get together early before training camp. And the great thing is, with today's technology, you can do a lot of meetings uh, if you know how to operate your computer correctly. So once again, I'm very honored. I thank Jim. I thank Mr. Wettenhall, Paul, everybody in the organization. I take this responsibility greatly for the players. I can assure you that I'm here for you guys. I'm here to make your your experience awesome and to win games and to make you better football players and to do things for the for the city of Montreal and the and the province of, of Quebec. And you know, I've talked to Jim a lot about some community and some football initiatives. We're excited about going in that direction. As I said, you cannot do this by yourself. You can. You're you know, I'm I'm the engine. I'm the engine inside, but you need all these points to connect. And the staff that we put together really is no nothing short of amazing. When you look at experience and what they bring, and I'm just going to start from this far end down here, our linebacker coach, uh, Mark Nelson, 
Mark is no stranger to the CFL. Comes to us from Edmonton. He played up here. He's coached up here. Uh, it's interesting. We had a little bit of a connection. Um, and there's a guy that I really respect named Bob Foster. And I called the guy in the CFL and I said, hey, I'm looking for a Bob Foster type guy. And he said, I got him. Mark Nelson. Um, excited. He's been a defensive coordinator. He's been a special teams guy. Brings a wealth of knowledge. Sitting next to him is our defensive line coach, Keith Willis. Keith was at North Carolina State. He was at Boston College. He played in the National Football League. Uh, Keith has mentored a lot of great defensive linemen into the National Football League that maybe were not always household names when he got them. A uh, good family guy, excited to have his experience on the staff. Next to him is Jean-Marc Edme. Jean-Marc has been with us for six years. He's been our defensive uh, quality control guy. I met Jean-Marc when I went to uh, Raleigh last year. Very valuable resource. Been a part of a lot of staffs here. A lot of teams. Knows the place inside and out. Uh, on the end over there, our, our special teams guru, uh, Ray Richleski. Oh, where, where'd we go? Yeah, I'm right there. Ray's there. Ray comes to us. He was with Indianapolis a long time. Again, this business is largely a who you know. It's a small world when you start whittling it down. You, all you got to do is call one guy who knows this guy. So you're working this angle. And uh, his knowledge and his passion for the game, NFL experience, longtime college coach, very well respected in Maryland and South Carolina, brings a lot to the game in terms of knowledge that way. Um, then we've got Noel Thorpe, no stranger to you guys, been with this organization before, been a head coach in his own right, um, is our defensive coordinator. He's worked with Mark before. One of the things that's impressive about this staff to me is that, you know, God forbid if I dropped dead of a heart attack, Jim would have a number of, of options to go to on this staff. There's no shortage of leaders. There's no shortage of experience. And... Uh, and I like that, and I welcome that. I think it's about having as many great uh, resumes in the room as, as you can get. So we're excited to have Noel. Uh, where am I at over here now? Then over, on, uh, over here, we've got Mike Miller. Mike comes to us from the Arizona Cardinals. Um, was, again, a guy that, uh, you know, Jim was talking about this guy. I also knew so I have some players at Arizona that know him. I know some guys in the NFL that know Mike. Very impressed with him as a person and very impressed with his teaching knowledge. And again, I've been very impressed. And AC and the, and the offensive guys will appreciate this. I mean, he's taking that playbook. And again, here's a guy that knows a ton of language, um, but we're all adapting to, to his playbook. And so I appreciate the experience and knowledge that he brings. He's been with some great coaches and great programs and had a, a long stint in the, in the NFL. No stranger to the CFL, another guy that could be a head coach, Doug Berry is on our staff. Uh, Doug is no stranger to you all, and he's no stranger to the CFL. He's already been a tremendous asset to us uh, because of his knowledge and his experience. And he's been great having in the room, speaking up. And as you guys know, there's a lot of ins and outs to this game and uh, the last three minutes of the game and all the special team situations. So uh, he's been a tremendous asset to us uh, already. Then Frank Verducci. Frank is a longtime coach. Uh, it's interesting because at one time, you know, we were all kind of the young, up-and-coming guys. Now we're the, the old and the to and long and the tooth guys. But Frank has had, again, exp extensive experience in the NFL uh, and in college. He's worked with Mike before, so those guys have a great relationship. Uh, then our receiver coach, Eric. I just have to say this because when you get a good nickname, it's Eric Campbell. But if your name's Campbell, your nickname is... Soup, that's right, Soup Campbell. So, uh, comes to us, was last at Iowa, was at Michigan, has mentored a lot of great receivers, has developed a lot of guys, been at the Naval Academy, uh, um, been at Syracuse. Again, another guy that has a lot of boots on the ground, and as I start kind of working in my circle, his name kept coming up as, hey, this guy's a great teacher, and he's a great person. Uh, down next to him is Mark Speckman. Mark and I coach together at Willamette, all right? There's some peculiarities you're going to notice about Mark, but the thing you're going to notice about him most is you're never going to meet a guy that has a more unique and creative take on life and humanity than Mark Speckman. He's nationally known down in the States. Uh, he's a big-time motivational speaker. Uh, he is a great teacher, and he has a great love 
for players in the game, and his creativity is, is second to none. The awesome thing about this game, as you guys know, with this unlimited motion, and I mean, my head about ready to explode with all the stuff you can do, and that guy down there, he's the wizard. He's the wizard. And then on the far end is Ryan Dinwiddie. Ryan played for us at Boise State, was a wrecking setting quarterback for us at Boise, and uh, had a small stint in the NFL, played in the Canadian League with Doug Berry uh, at Saskatchewan, and played in a, in a Grey Cup at, at Winnipeg as well. So. This is a, an awesome group. I thank uh, Mr. Wettenhall and, and Jim Pop for helping us put these guys together, allowing us to put these guys together. And I, I know it's it's not, it, it, they always, coaches always sit up there, hey, I'm excited, but I, I am jacked. I got uh, a ton of experience sitting up here, a ton of boots on the ground, a ton of success, a ton of great people, and I can't wait to get this thing going and get together with an already talented football team work at what we've done well in the past and find things that we can continue to do better but from Mr. Wettenhall I thank, Jim Pop I thank, Mark Tressman I thank and I thank all of you in this city and I hope next year that I talk to you my French is much better I'm sure I mispronounced every word in there God bless you and thank you Thank you Coach Hawkins Bienvenue à Montréal, welcome to Montreal Nous allons maintenant ouvrir la période de questions aux médias Nous vous serions reconnaissants d'utiliser le micro qu'un de mes <coughs> collègues vous apportera afin que ceux qui suivent la conférence de presse en direct sur le web ou à la télé puissent bien entendre votre question. Veuillez s'il vous plaît vous identifier ainsi que le média que vous vous représentez. We will now take questions from the media. We are asking you to please use the microphone in order to help those who are following this press conference live on the web or on TV to hear your question. A microphone is available for those who have questions. Please identify yourself and the media you represent. Hi, Dan. Uh, this is Jeremy Filosa from 98.5 FM, Montreal. Jeremy. Welcome to Montreal. Um, I just wanted to ask you, are there any players on this roster that you know or have coached or have come across in, uh, in your career? Well, we recruited Jeff Parrott, but unfortunately I didn't do a very good job at Boise because he went to Tulsa. So I'm looking forward to having him on the right team now. Uh, Andrew Woodruff played for us at Boise State. Know him. There's a couple other Boise State guys uh, on the roster that were not necessarily uh, part of it last year. You know, those guys I know the most. Um, a lot of them I certainly have familiarity spending time with, with Coach Tressman and his staff last year and just watching them a boatload of team, uh, film and then following the team through the season. But those guys, you know, I, I know, but the other guys, I'll learn. Hi, Coach. Uh, Douglas Hi. Gallivan with uh, CBC. Um, we, we don't know much about you up here, uh, but there have been a few clips in the media playing <laughs> uh, of you going on, I guess you could call them rants. Um, what can we expect from you as what a coach? What can you expect from me? Oh, my gosh. More rats. The age of the internet. First of all, let me just explain this. And I, and I know this, obviously, from working in the media. It, it really wasn't. It really wasn't. It was a couple of guys. I'm a very passionate guy. And those guys know when I'm mad, I can't even hardly open my mouth, number one. So it wasn't on video. And it was really, we were just kind of sitting around, sort of yucking it up. And, you know, this guy, we, there was five of us sitting there. It really wasn't a rant. I said, trust me, if I go on a rant, you'll, you'll know it. Um, the other thing that happens, I think, with, with modern media, it's you've got two sides to it. One, when you're very open and honest, and, uh, you know, sometimes people will chop that up and move it in a different direction. Or you can all come, and I can say yes and no. And that's the safe way to do it. That's not really me. But I am very honest. I am very open. I realize the connection with the fans, the connection with the media. Uh, sometimes I know it can be taken and run with and like that thing was and caught like wildfire. But trust me, most of the guys that know me, they, they were laughing about it. Uh, but I certainly know the, the impact of it. It was, really, it was really interesting how that all went. But trust me, if I'm ranting, you'll, you'll know it. But that, that was not it. Uh, did the Jews, RDS? Did the Army Jews or RDS? Uh, Coach Hawkins, unfortunately, things didn't go as planned in Colorado yeah. after you left Boise. What makes you think that you'll be able to adapt to the CFL game? Well, obviously, we have a ton of experience up here. And like I said before, it's interesting in life. <laughs> the team. 
tip of the spear. And there's a lot of great coaches that have lost some games. <laughs> and, and had some, But that's where the learning is the richest. Uh, I have a guy in the software industry who says, you know, Hawk, if you were in the software industry, everybody would be after you. They want the entrepreneurial spirit. They want the guy that's risking. They want the guy that's trying. They want the guy that's growing. So I've had tremendous success everywhere. We did some amazing things there at Colorado. We didn't win as many games. We could not reach the tipping point. But the benefit, the benefit is all that, le all those lessons, which are hard learned, hard learned, you bring those to bear. Whereas maybe in another situation, a guy that hasn't been through that, he doesn't even know what he doesn't know. I've been there. I've lived it. I've seen it on both sides. So in terms of the CFL game, clearly do I have a lot to learn? You bet. We're going to grind. I'm fortunate that I've got some guys on the staff that have been there and seen it and done it and have been through it. And we'll lean on those guys a bunch. And we'll research, we'll research the heck out of it. Will we make some mistakes? I'm sure we will. But I know this. Life is about learning. And you fail, you learn, you get back up and you roll. And that's always been my mantra. Even at Boise State or the other places I've been, we weren't always dynamic. It wasn't great every single year. But you take those lessons, you move forward, you just keep getting better. And that's always been my philosophy too. It's, hey, we could win every single game. And these guys know, and our approach will be every single day after the game is how do we get better? Not did we win or did we lose? That's not it. It's can, can we get better? How can we improve? And that's our philosophy. But what are some of the lessons that you've learned at uh, Colorado? Man, there's too many of them to, to, to recount here. There's too many of them. But, uh, the main but one I guarantee you. One. Name one. Um, too whew. many. Yeah, there's too, there's too many. There's too many. And I can get to that later. Uh, bonjour, Dan. Philippe Quentin de La Presse uh, à Montréal. Uh, Dan, uh, in what frame of mind do you take this job? Do you take it uh, like to be here for a long term, or you see it more as a springboard for a top college job in the USA or for the NFL? Well, like I said, I've turned down or, or, or taken myself out of situations. Um, I'm a live-in-the-moment guy. I, I really am. I could see myself being here forever. Uh, I turned down some other opportunities to come to this this opportunity and even some of the guys I talked to about coming on the staff they said well Hawk what are you, what are you thinking about I mean, what you, what's, what's your plan out I said guys I could be there forever I mean if, you know if it's great like I think it's going to be great we could be here forever um, the reality is in, in modern entertainment as it is they said you know even eventually they cats they took off of Broadway and they, they canceled MASH and you know eventually all the all the great shows get canceled uh, but I think I learned from one of my mentors a long time ago. He said, Hawk, never take a job that you couldn't spend the rest of your life doing. And that's why I've approached every job like I have. I think you have to enjoy living there. You have to enjoy the, the essence of what the place is about. And then you can invest yourself. And if you're there forever, fine. But I don't think you want to go to a place that you say, well, we're just going to stay around until things happen and then bounce out of there. I just... That's not my personality. That's not how I operate. Coach Hawk, it's Rick Moffat from CJD Radio. Welcome. Congratulations. Uh, some of the players you coached in college tell me they had a nickname for you, and it was Thunder Dan because they knew at some point during the week they'd hear your thunder. How much of an adjustment do you think it will be to deal with pro players as opposed to college players? Well, and I think they would tell you that that is enthusiasm it's not I have a tremendous amount of passion for this game and uh, while I might be a little bit more verbose than Mark uh, I'm also not the guy that runs around with his head cut off 24-7 uh, but I am very passionate I'm, I, I enjoy life I'm a guy that loves getting out on the grass I love coming to work in the morning I just have that sort of energy and that sort of passion um, so that's my whole approach to it I don't really care whether you're 12 years or you're you know, you're 52 years, whether you're, you're on the staff, I think there has to be a certain amount of energy that, that rolls in there. But the ultimate motivation is, is what you're doing in your preparation. Your ultimate motivation is getting guys ready to play so that they have confidence in what they're doing and can go out and be successful on game day and have some success there. That's the ultimate motivation. Uh, Mitch Gallo, uh, TSN 690. Just wondering if... Uh, Hold on, Mitch. Where are you? 
Alors euh, voilà les Alouettes qui ont leur 20e entraîneur-chef de l'histoire. Dan Hawkins, Mathieu, ça a été un point de presse très intéressant. Oui. On a entendu le mot passion plusieurs fois. On, un sait, un qu est passionné. on passionné. sait qu'il est passionné. <rire> on fait une courte pause, des commentaires Absolument. sur l'arrivée de Dan Hawkins tout de suite après pour regarder cette émission spéciale sur la nomination du nouvel entraîneur-chef des Alouettes. C'est un soir jambon. Mais la bonne délicieux pourrait sûrement faire euh, différent. Et masquinongé. Oh! 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 Je me suis fait faire ça. C'est oh! pas cool. Je ne veux pas de cette tentation devant mes yeux. Délicieux sans votre soupe et de la routine. Aussi bonne qu'au resto et offerte en 23 variétés. C'est pas du resto, c'est délicieux. Tournoi des cœurs scottis du 16 au 24 février sur RDS2. Qu'est-ce que ça prend pour rendre nos enfants plus heureux? Comment faire pour qu'ils soient plus en santé, plus forts et plus confiants? Recommençons à jouer. Chez Participation, nous croyons qu'il faut sortir les casques de vélo des boulamites et rejouer à la cachette. Donnons-leur 60 minutes par jour de l'activité physique qui nous gardait heureux et en santé quand nous étions jeunes. Recommençons à jouer. Participation, on s'active. associations de hockey mineurs à travers le Canada et nous sollicitons votre aide. Dites-nous qui maintient le hockey bien en vie au sein de votre collectivité. Partagez votre histoire sur craftlehockeycontinue.ca grâce à vous. Présenté par des tranches de fromage singles de Kraft. Savourez chaque instant. Un club chargé d'histoire. Seul et même passion. Voyez les matchs de l'élite britannique. La ligue de soccer anglaise Barclays à RDS. Avec une aussi longue garantie, les futurs conducteurs ont eux aussi leur mot à dire. Retour à cette émission spéciale, les Alouettes qui ont confirmé la nomination de Dan Hawkins comme nouvel entraîneur-chef de l'équipe. Mathieu, on vient d'entendre le point de presse et la locution de Dan Hawkins pendant une vingtaine de minutes. Comment tu l'as trouvé? Parce que moi, honnêtement, là, le mot « passionné » il a, et <rire> « passion », on l'a entendu souvent. C'est un gars passionné. Et ça résume ça bien, ouais. euh, en tout cas, l'impression qu'il a donnée. Et je pense qu'on a... Jim Pop a fait un bon choix, en tout cas, de l'impression qu'on a aujourd'hui. Je pense qu'il a fait une excellente première impression. Vraiment, franchement, j'ai beaucoup aimé ce que j'ai vu. J'ai aimé ce que j'ai entendu. J'ai aimé la direction qu'il prenait. J'ai aimé le ton qu'il avait. J'ai aimé même comment il a présenté ses entraîneurs adjoints. Donc, vraiment, pour moi, c'était une excellente entrée en matière pour Dan Hawkins. Euh, il a parlé, il a fait des commentaires pour moi qui sont très indicatifs. Il a parlé d'humilité. Pour moi, quelqu'un qui rentre, un entraîneur qui rentre, bon, arrive des rangs universitaires américains, ne connaît pas la Ligue canadienne. S'il rentre, il dit « Non, non, moi, je connais ça. » Euh, je n'ai regardé, je suis allé au camp, je suis pas inquiet. C'est bien entouré, non, là. Exactement, il a dit non. Il dit, moi, je suis humble. Il dit, est-ce que j'ai des choses à apprendre? Il dit, mais en que j'ai des choses à apprendre. J'en ai plein. C'est pour ça que je me suis entouré de gens comme Doug Berry, comme Noel Thorpe, comme Jean-Marc Henry, comme euh, Mark Nelson. Des joueurs qui ont cette expérience au niveau de la Ligue canadienne. Et pour moi, ça, c'est extrêmement indicateur d'un gars qui n'a pas peur de bien s'entourer. Et il l'a dit. Il a dit tout ce que j'ai accompli dans ma vie, je l'ai fait en équipe, je l'ai fait avec du monde autour de moi. Et encore une fois, on l'a vu justement avec ce commentaire-là. Donc, 
Excellente première impression. Quel impact ça peut avoir sur les joueurs d'avoir ce, ce genre d'entraîneur-là, parce que bon, on est habitué au, au règne Trassman, mm -hmm. mais d'avoir dans le vestiaire à côtoyer, il l'a dit, moi je vais être un guide pour mes athlètes. Mm -hmm. Comment tu penses que les joueurs vont réagir à ça? Bien, il a dit qu'il avait plusieurs ressemblances avec Tressman. Oui. Et, et c'est vrai que dans ses commentaires, dans son approche, il va être un pédagogue, un mentor, veut rendre les joueurs meilleurs. Veut, bon, ça, il dit qu'il aime la science du football. C'est beaucoup de choses que j'entendais, moi, Tressman dire. Bon, pour lui, par contre, on l'a appelé Thunder Dan. Hein, le les nom... joueurs collégiaux l'appelaient comme Exactement, ça. Exactement. Quelqu'un qui est beaucoup... Qui, qui va, bouillant, peut-être. Bouillant. Peut bouillant puis, il, il, je pense qu'on a peut-être mal interprété. Les, les gens voient peut-être ça comme il pète des plombs, mais c'est pas nécessairement le cas. Il dit, encore une fois, il est revenu avec le mot passionné. Il dit, je suis quelqu'un qui est passionné, puis oui, je vais lever le ton, puis oui, à un moment donné, s'il faut que je crie, je vais crier. Mais il dit, je ne suis pas comme une poule, pas de tête, avec la tête coupée, qui mm. se court pendant 24 heures 7. Il dit, dans le fond, il dit, ça va m'arriver. Moi, j'ai eu des entraîneurs comme ça. J'ai pas eu d'entraîneur chef de ce type-là. J'ai eu des entraîneurs adjoints qui étaient des entraîneurs qui, bon, par l'effort, criaient, se laissaient emporter des fois. C'est un couteau à double tranchant, parce qu'il faut calculer quand on fait ce genre de sortie-là. Si on le fait tout le temps, à un moment donné, ça perd sa valeur, puis c'est difficile de motiver ses joueurs. Mais en même temps, lorsqu'il faut brasser les troupes, un entraîneur comme ça, pour moi, peut faire le boulot. Donc, je pense qu'il a un beau bagage. Je pense qu'il semble avoir une personnalité intéressante pour le groupe de joueurs qu'il en place. On a beaucoup de nouveaux joueurs, beaucoup de nouveaux venus. On a une nouvelle équipe, un nouveau coaching staff. Il faut quelqu'un qui soit fort. Il faut quelqu'un qui soit capable de ramener Ça va être bon aussi au niveau ça. marketing. Le Absolument. visage des Alouettes, c'est Anthony Cardio. Mais la volubilité, le dynamisme de ce gars-là, ça va aider la, la formation. Mark Whitman l'a dit d'entrée de jeu. Les Alouettes ont été critiqués pour leur place au sein du public. Dan Hawkins peut jouer un grand rôle justement à redorer cette image-là et amener un personnage que les gens vont s'attacher. Merci beaucoup, Mathieu. Merci d'avoir été avec nous. On fait une pause au retour au bulletin complet d'informations. À tout de suite.